look with me back in the book of Revelation. How many is enjoying the book of Revelation? Are you enjoying the study of the book of Revelation? I know a lot of people are excited to get to chapter 4 because of what's... That was Jordan. He raised his hand. He must have taken ownership for that one. Uh, that's pretty neat, though. How do you do that? And no, I'm just kidding. Don't do it now. But there's a lot of people looking forward to Revelation chapter 4 because they're wanting to understand about the catching away of the church. And most people's got a lot of questions, and I've been in it long enough that I try to ask those questions, and I do the best I can to answer, give an answer to those questions. So once we get to Revelation 4, we've got about think two more churches, this church and I think one more, the church of Laodicea, and then we'll be in uh, the chapter 4, so a couple more weeks and we'll be there. So uh, if you want to learn about the catching away of the church and you got other people that don't understand it, you know, you want them to be here because there, there's three views when it comes to the end time. It's what they call the pre-tribulation view, the mid-tribulation, the post-tribulation, and the post-tribulation view just basically says you're going all through it. The mid tribulations, pre self explanatory ways, halfway through you'll go up in in the mid mid tribulation. And then of course I I take the stance as a pre tribulation view and we'll show you why that I choose to take that view. I believe it's I believe it's biblical. But tonight we are talking about the church of Philadelphia. Turn with me to Revelation chapter three. Look with me in verse seven. Revelation three Verse 7, I would say that if all, most of us was honest with ourselves, that we've already found ourselves somewhere in one of these churches. And the church of Philadelphia, while you're turning there, the word Philadelphia literally means the city of brotherly love. It's one of the only churches out of all seven where there has there was nothing Jesus could find to condemn in this particular church. And... Uh, and so he deals with this with this wonderful church. And I tell you, brother, I'd like to be one of them to where he don't find no fault with us, wouldn't you? And this is one of these particular churches. I'll just read down and we'll jump right into uh, what it is to have the, the city of brotherly love. Uh, turn with me to Revelation 3, verse 7. Have you found it? Say amen. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. The Bible said unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia, I write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Jesus says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and to worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them and that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I, will, I come quickly. Hold fast, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful, Lord God, again tonight for all that you've already done for us, Lord, for what we've already got the feel. Lord, we know that you're here with us tonight. You said where two or three are gathered together in your name that you'd be in the midst. And Lord, we know that you're here. Father, we're asking you, Lord, tonight, God, to anoint me just for a little while, Father, to teach your word. I don't want to get off and no ideas or opinions or some kind of a tradition of a man-made idea, but Lord, we always want to stay true to your word, Father, we pray. And I'm asking you to open our hearts tonight let the Holy Ghost begin to Sow this word upon good ground. And we'll never fail to give you praise and glory for it all. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody says amen and amen. Interesting enough tonight, as I've already said, the church of Philadelphia is one of the seven churches where Jesus had nothing to condemn in that particular church. Almost in every church there was what we call a commendation that Jesus had something that he would commend concerning that church. But then in almost every one of them he would say, but... I have somewhat against thee. And then he would go right into the church and begin to share with them what was at fault in that particular local church. 
But here at the Church of Philadelphia, there was really nothing that uh, Christ could say uh, that was wrong in that church. In fact, the word Philadelphia itself means the city of brotherly love. And how many knows that love is the greatest restraint from doing anything evil, whether it be in the eyes of God or whether it be committing some sin against man? In fact, the Bible said, He that loveth his brother worketh no evil toward his neighbor. Love is the greatest restraint that we have in our hearts not to sin against God or our brother or our sister. Uh, in fact, I, I heard a guy say one time, and uh, you know, on. Uh, I don't, know, I don't know if it was on the radio or if it was on some uh, preacher preaching on the TV or what it was, but he said that he travels all over the world and that he never um, um, has, you know, stepped out of the way concerning, you know, uh, any kind of thing impure w with his wife, not because he said that the Bible condemns it. And, of course, I wanted to get real close and see now what he's about to say, but he said it's because he loved her. The law of love was stronger sometimes than, than the command of God itself because he loved his wife. He didn't, want to, he didn't want to sin against his wife. So love is the greatest restraint that we have in our hearts or in our life not to commit whether sin against God or to work evil against our neighbor. And this city was, in fact, the city of brotherly love. And, and I guess before that I need to go into this, how many knows that love is the greatest thing, any best, any characteristic that a child of God could ever not only possess, but he's but practically live out in his life in this world. I'm actually reading this book with a uh, a full time missionary who made this statement and said that it's up to us to make the love of God real, to make it concrete, to put the love of God basically in boots so the whole world can see the love and the mercy of God shine through us. And so when we think about the love of God, you know, some people think that love is just a characteristic of God or if it's just an attribute of God or if it's just a faucet of his uh, personality. But how many knows that that's not exactly right? In fact, John says God is love. If you was to take God who he is and all that he is, if you was to just play it all out, God is a God of love. Whether he disciplines us, he does it in love. And, and no matter what he does, he is always out of motivation of love. In fact, Jesus himself would say that no greater love of a man than this, than he laid down his own life for his friends. And when Jesus came, he didn't come to die for the righteous. He came to die for the, for the sinner, for the ungodly, for the unholy. And so Jesus didn't just talk about what love was. He actually lived out and walked out what love was. He demonstrated that love on the cross of Calvary. When he gave of his own life. And many times I've made this statement here. That Jesus did not die a martyr's death. Which would imply that someone took his life by force. He didn't have a martyr's death. Jesus said that he laid his life down of his own self. He had this power to lay his life down. And to take his life up again. Jesus said no man can take my life. I lay it down. And so when he come to this world. He physically, willfully on purpose, laid his own life down for the sins of, of mankind. And I've always made, made this statement. If God is a God of love, and he demonstrated that love on the cross of Calvary, the day we got saved, the day we got born again, and Christ come to live and take his abode up in our heart, can I tell you that the, we ought to be able to show the love of God in our hearts. The first fruit that we ought to exhibit in our life is the love of God toward, toward God and toward each other. In fact, Paul would say it this way, that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. And he ain't talking about our love to God, but God's love to us. For the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. He confirms and assures his love to us. And because once we get saved, we ought to have the love of God for each other. And that uh, we ought to demonstrate that. In fact, you all heard me say this. When I got saved, the sky looked bluer, the grass looked greener, and everybody looked good to me. I mean, everybody, people that I didn't care much about, I wanted to go out and hug their neck. And so the Bible would say it this way, that we know we pass from death into life. Why? Because we want love our brother. And Paul tells us, uh, you know, that we are to walk in love. He commands us how to love. He shows us what love is, and I've always said this, that anything God can command us to do and teach us to do, it's not out of our control to do. And love oftentimes is a choice, not just simply a feeling. You choose 
to love people, even when they're not very lovely at all. And so this church was an ideal uh, uh, example of what that was. When you begin to study the history of the Church of Philadelphia, this church was in a very uh, unique place. In fact, they said that the Church of Philadelphia actually bordered three, three towns, like Lydia and Mysia and, and Phrygia. It was a, a very, uh, it was a, it was a town that was strategically placed. It was a town where they said one of the main Roman roads that went through that place, where they said where the Roman soldiers would travel, where people would conduct business, where salespersons, you know, vacationers, tourists, whatever it is, would be able very easily accessed uh, from anywhere through the place called Philadelphia. So it was strategically placed so that it might be able to be an evangelistic or a missionary-minded church. And this is what we're going to see as we begin to move on down. Listen to what Jesus said to Revelation 3 and 7. The first thing he said was, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write. And of course, we've always said the word angel simply means messenger. Or he's writing to the church overseers, pastors at that particular time, to make known what he wants to uh, conveyed to that particular uh, church. He said, I want you to write because these things saith he that is holy and he that is true. Jesus points right out and calls himself and describes himself as the one who is holy and him that is true. Holy means to be set apart, but how many holy also means to be sanctified and set apart and pure from sin? <coughs> and, in fact, everything that is connected to God the Father is holy. When Moses saw the burning bush and God said, Take off your shoe, Moses, for the ground in which you stand upon is holy. Do you know what made it holy? The presence of God was there that made it holy. When you read all of the, all of the shovels, the lampstands, everything that was connected to the work of God in the temple was called holy vessels. They were set apart for the use of what God wanted them to do. Uh, in fact, the, the priest himself would wear a mitre and he would have a he'd have an he'd have an inscription that would say, Holiness unto the Lord. Everything that was connected to God was considered holy. And how many knows I could stop right here and talk to you and I that when you and I got saved and born again, the Spirit of God took us, baptized us in the body of Christ, and now we are to be a what? A holy people unto God. It's not a suggestion. In fact, it's a command. Peter would say, Be ye holy as I am holy, saith the Lord. Second Corinthians 7 would say, Having these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit and perfect holiness in the fear of God. So it becomes a responsibility that's laid upon us that we're to perfect the holiness of God in our life as we live out practically what we are positionally in the eyes of God. So Jesus said, um, he's holy, he's separate, he's pure, he's undefiled, he's without sin. And then he goes as far and says, he's true, which means he's not a counterfeit. He's the real deal. He is the Lord God of heaven. And then he says, he that hath to give David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. This is a reference to Isaiah 22 and 22 that would say this. And the key of the house of David will I lay on him, that means Eliakim, shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall open. The old Bible tells us a king Hezekiah had a servant by the name of Eliakim. He was a servant of that king and he held the, the position of authority that no man could come into the king's presence or leave the king's presence without Eliakim allowing them to come in. He held the key. He held the authority of those who come into the king's presence and those who, who was even able to get an audience with the king. And when, and, and when Jesus says, He that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth, Jesus is saying that he is the only one who has the authority to allow man into the presence of a holy God. How knows you can approach God without first coming through Jesus? He is the door. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. And he holds the key of David. And he opens a door that no man can shut. And he shuts doors that no man can open. And he has the authority to be able to do that very thing. In fact, there's not a man on the face of this world that will ever come into the presence of God without first going through Jesus. In fact, 
even under the old uh, law, the Bible would talk about that when God would lay out what they call the Ark of the Covenant, it was a box uh, inlaid with gold, outlaid with gold, and inside of that box was the two tables of stone. They were the Aaron's rod that budded, and there was a little thing of a manna that followed with them throughout the wilderness journeys. But on top of that was the mercy seat. And uh, how many knows the Bible said that God told Moses and the priest, I will meet with you on that mercy seat. That's where the Shekinah glory, the, the glory of God would, would appear. It would settle in that holies of holies, and he would speak with them off of that mercy seat, and that mercy seat represents Jesus Christ. And God the Father said, I will meet with you right there. I will speak with you right there because there's no other way that a sinful, imperfect man can approach a holy God except through the person of Jesus Christ. He chooses who comes and who goes out. Who goes in, who goes out. And if we're going to approach God, it must be through the person of Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter how good we are, how good morals we've got, how good our values are. If we've never been born again and we don't approach God through Christ, how knows we'll never make it to the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how good of a person that we've been. And so he literally says, he opens this door and there's not a man on the world that's got power to shut it and he shuts doors that no man can open. And uh, I'm glad that there's some doors that I can't open. Can you say amen? And I'm glad there's some doors that God shuts that no man can open. I'm glad there's certain doors that God opens for me that there's no man can close. Uh, and like I said, you know, the other night, you know, some storms God sends to our life is storms not to hurt us, but to preserve us. Amen. So listen to what it says in verse 8. I know thy works. And, I, and you know, I can't, I can't express this enough that in every church, Jesus said, I know your works. And what we've got to realize is he's not a God that's afar off. He's a God that's near. He's, not, he's a God that's very much a part of what we're doing. There's a universal church. Every person that's bought and uh, bought by the blood, washed in the blood, that's been born again, every one of them people belong to the universal church of Jesus Christ. But they're, but they're local churches. And Jesus is a part of every single local church and everything that's going on. He understands and knows what's going on in those churches and so he says i know your works not just i don't know about them i'm not hearing about it before. he knows it up close and personal because then he says behold i have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it for you have little strength and has kept my word and has not denied my name and one man said that the door that was set before the church of philadelphia was none other than the door of evangelism and missions in order to reach people he had opened an effectual door of good works that they might reach out unto the lost and to the dying world at that time. And it didn't matter who didn't like it, they had no power to shed it. Again, they were strategically placed on, on a, a border town that bordered three towns. Lydia, Phrygia, and Mysia. A major Roman road came through there. Tons of people came through there year after year after year. And there they had an open door of, of evangelism. And how many knows today I want God to know my works? I know we're saved by God's grace through faith. But every person in this place has got a work that God wants them to do and accomplish for him in this life. Every person has something to do to benefit the, benefit the body of Christ. Everybody's not a preacher. Everybody's not a singer. Everybody's not a, a Sunday school teacher. There's some people that are just prayer warriors. There's just some people that are that are just got different gifts and different talents and different abilities that the Lord wants us to use for for His for for His glory, for His praise, and for His honor. But everything that we do, it becomes an open door. How many's ever had uh, things that you'd like to do and and seem how many you prayed about it and fasted about it, but that door never seemed to open up for you? You know, the Bible said your gift will make room for you. You know, I think it's very, very important that people know where they belong in the body of Christ. That, you know, the Bible says we're to make our calling and we're to make our election sure. And then once we know where we belong, the Bible tells us that we are to abide in that calling. Do you remember King David when David was just a, uh, just starting out as king? He came into David's heart that he wanted to build a house for God. 
I mean, his motive was right. His intent was right. His, his heart was in the right place. He wanted to build God a house. And yet, even the prophet Nathan came along and said, yeah, go ahead, do all that's in your heart. Well, that night, Nathan got to praying about it. And the voice of the Lord came to David, or Nathan and said, you go tell David it's not going to build that house because he is a bloody man. Even though his heart was in the right place and his, and, and, and his intent was there and his, and, and his desire was right, can I tell you, it still wasn't God's will for him to do that. And David didn't get upset and get mad and get puffed up and say, well, I just won't do nothing for God. No, he did what he could to ensure his son success when he built the house of God. And so many times we got to realize what God's called us to do. There's a lot of people whose heart's in the right place. They've got a good desire in what they want to do. But friends, you have to be called and gifted of God to do that. You know, and so many times people say, well, if I can't do that, I just ain't going to do Nothing. How sad is that? Think with me back in David. I just got to study this. And David, when he first came, very young man, he just over he just killed a, a nine foot nine inch giant. Saul was jealous. He felt like his throne was actually threatened by, by David. In fact, he told Jonathan and said, Jonathan, don't you know that as long as, as David lives, your kingdom, it wasn't God's kingdom, your kingdom will never be established. Can I tell you? Jonathan never felt threatened David. If anybody who should have felt threatened or got on, the, got on the defense, it should have been Jonathan because he was the crown prince. He was the next one in line to take the throne, to, be, to, 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 to have the place of authority. But the Bible said that Jonathan's heart was knit with David. He loved David. And he realized that David was the next man in line that God had gifted him to succeed even his own father. So what did Jonathan do? He didn't get upset and try to kill him and murder him. He, he found David, gave him his robe, gave him his sword, gave him his shield, gave him everything and said, I, I want to make a covenant with you so that if when, when you come to the throne, I want you to preserve my seed forever. And what happens is sometimes people get so upset that they're trying to do something that it's really not God's will for them to do. And they're trying to make it happen and they're trying to force it happen. And when jealousy sets in, instead of just falling in behind somebody and upholding them and strengthening them and helping them to, to do what God's called them to do, they'll do what Saul did. They'll seek out to kill them. Can you say amen? Every one of us has a very strong, particular call of God on our life. And all we have to do is find out what God wants us to do. And when we do that, it becomes easy for you. It's not a burden. Yes, there's, yes it's, it takes sacrifice. It takes, a lot of, you know, it takes a lot of Bible study to be a Bible teacher or a pastor or some kind of preacher. Prayer will cost you time. Come on now. And sacrifice and commitment. But can I tell you, I'm no singer, and you don't want to hear me sing, really, you know? I mean, I, I have a hard time playing the radio, guys, you know? I mean, so that's not my strong suit. And so, so really, you'd rather hear me here than up there trying to do what Brother Stanley does. But Stanley's gifted in singing. You've got uh, Katie and, uh, and Justin, they're gifted at music. They're just, they're, it just becomes, it's something that comes natural. It just flows through them. I, I talked to Janet, I said, Talking to her earlier, you know, just, just this evening, I said, our kids love Janet. These young, these young kids, when they all oh, sister Janet, man, I mean, they loved her class and how she was uh, creative and, you know, and made her, made their lesson real. People come on and talk about Miss Janet because it comes easy for people that are called to a certain place. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it may be, yes, it may take sacrifice. Yes, it may be commitment. But can I tell you, friends? Whatever is on your heart, whatever gets you up every morning, whatever pushes you, that's the gifting that God's placed in your life. I, I can remember years ago that I asked Brother Junior Collins and I first started out being saved to the Lord. I said, Junior, how do I know what God wants me to do? He said, whatever the Lord's blessing you at, that's what the Lord wants you to do. I've seen people early on, you know, try to get up and preach and they can't hold nobody's attention. People get tired. They get bored. They even get up and walk out on. I mean, how many ever seen that? You know, it's just, it comes to a place where you got to wake up and realize maybe this is not what God wants me to do. And listen, guys, there's nothing wrong with, with uh, stepping back and saying, well, maybe I need to reevaluate what the Lord wants me to do. Because what, whatever God wants you to do, 
that's where you're going to fit. In fact, the Bible said he puts us in the body where it pleases him, right? And so these guys, he said, I know your works. Behold, I've set before you an open door, and that was a door of evangelism and a door of missions. And every person in this church has something that God wants you to do to fulfill your purpose, your plan, your destiny, your dream, whatever that thing may be, God wants to enable you to be able to do that. And so he says, I've set that door before you and no man can shut it. And I'm glad that there's no man can stop what God's got for you. I mean, uh, you know, we, we can stop right here and talk about just where this church has been in almost in two and a half years, almost three years. I mean, you, you think about how the enemy has tried to hold, just hold back this church. When we went down here to buy the property where our church was at, where, 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 where we're about to build our church, Sharon will tell you, when we first pastored Pine Hill, we walked on that property, and we was considering buying that property to build a house on. That's how long that property had been up for sale. That sign had been there. We walked on that property almost six years ago, did we not? Well, we just didn't feel like that's what we needed to do. Well, then lo and behold, we come down here and we went down there and that, and God laid peace on our heart that this is where the church was to be and that property was for sale for seven, eight, nine, ten years probably. Well, when we were go about to close on that property, someone made a cash offer on that land and said we'll not have to go through no banks. We won't have to do nothing. You just take the cash right now. And they said, and, and we'll purchase that right now. And thank God we had a man who was committed and said, no, I've done got that to the church. You see, many times there have been things that happened that most of you don't even know about, but I've seen God's hand move in this church over and over and over and over again to commit himself to what we are about to do in Rock Castle County. And when he opens that door, there ain't a physical man there's not a plot the devil can put to stop what God wants you to do when it's God's will for it to happen. Church, listen, if, even if the righteous, even if the godly won't support it, he'll send, the, he'll send the devil to support it. You may say, I don't know about that. Well, let me tell you. Elijah was down there during a time of famine, and he was down by the brook, and that brook was there, and how many knows he sent a raven every day to feed him? That raven, according to the law, was an unclean bird. It wasn't a clean bird. It was the most unlikeless bird in the world that would bring him food. And he used an unclean bird to support the man of God during the time of famine. And if God can't get the godly to do it, he'll get a ranked sinner. Come on now. And he'll put it on their heart and he'll walk over and he'll write a check and he'll fund the thing because when God puts something in line and in order... It'll happen because God is still God. Amen. And so he says no man can shut it. And this little church was active. It was alive. It was loving people. And God opened this door for them to go out and work. And he said, don't worry, no man's going to be able to shut it. In fact, in a world that they were living in, how many know that, that Rome would have loved to shut that, to shut that church down? Listen to what the Bible said. And he said, for thou hast little strength. One man made the statement and said when it said the church had only little strength was an idea that it was just a, a small church. A small church in number. It was a small church in resources. But this little small church was reaching out to the lost. It was witnessing. It was bearing a, a testimony of salvation and hope and eternal life through Jesus Christ. And they were doing so much good that it made an impression upon Jesus himself the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, so much so that he commends the church for doing it and guaranteed that the door would never be shut to the work of that church. It doesn't matter if you got five people or ten people or a thousand people, guys. It, it, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're in the, in the middle of the city or right out in a holler. If you're dedicated to the work of God, God will give you a work to do. And it's took me years to realize some of the things I'm teaching you now. And so he, here we're saying, he said, you've got little strength, yes. But he said, number two, you have kept my word. Maybe these people went from house to house. Maybe they witnessed the fellow the neighbors, friends, and families. And they were probably always looking for an opportunity to bear witness for Jesus. 
I think I heard Carl talk about Buster, the guy that got shot. He said every person that got in his car, he witnessed to him, didn't he? Witnessed to him. A friend of mine, Jason Carpenter, some of y'all know him. He was a state trooper. I heard Amanda Ballard, which is uh, was Sister Moody, was Brother Moody's daughter. I went to school her, and she had some family or something that was being arrested, and Jason was the officer that was taking them somewhere. And so when he got in the car with Jason, he had a several miles to ride. He said by the time he got out of the vehicle, that guy was crying, he was weeping, and he had led him to the Lord in the back of that police car. You see what I'm saying? We have to look for opportunities because opportunities make themselves available every single day if we will just yet look for those opportunities to be able to share Christ with them. I heard Donald Sims the other night that got me thinking. He said they have asked the Lord to give them a hundred souls for for the for the next three years, a hundred souls per year. And I got to thinking about that. And that got, got, got going over my mind. And we reach out to, to the mission field. And in fact, we, we do that CTMF. And the people that we actually sponsor, they have to have like 10,000 verbal witnesses. I mean, I mean 10,000 families have to have a verbal witness. And they have to record it. Each, each one of those two church planners back there has to have a verbal witness of 10,000 people in one year in, in Sudan. So we're building two churches and by the end of the first year there'll be 20,000 people that's had a verbal witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if they don't do it, they pull their funds and they start funding somebody else. And I got to think about that and, and, and I said, if it works in foreign countries, why can't it work here? I mean, we're, we're living in the fourth largest mission field in the world is the United States of America. The fourth largest mission field in the world is the United States of of America. And sometimes we feel backwards and we, we think everybody knows about Jesus and yes they may know but how many of us have asked the Lord you know give me somebody let me cross somebody in my path give me an opportunity to say something about you I told the Lord I said Lord I don't care if I'm in a barber shop if I'm at Walmart if I'm walking down the road Lord if you'll give me an opportunity to share you with somebody I want to share you with somebody and I'm telling you, friends, there, there's nothing no greater than leading somebody to Jesus. If you lead one person to Jesus, you're hooked. If you get one person saved, if you lead one person to Jesus, you and them one-on-one -on -one, and you're praying them through the salvation, you're hooked forever because it'll get in your skin. It'll get in your heart. And you'll want to, do, you'll want to lead more and more to the kingdom of heaven. And this church was looking for opportunities. It had little strength. But Jesus said this, you've kept my word, which meant that they studied the word of God. They probably lived the word of God. And they probably took time to proclaim the word of God. Number two, they said that they have not denied his name. And oftentimes when we think about denying his name, we think about somebody coming up and saying, are you a Christian? And if we say no, we think that's the only way you can deny Christ. But you can deny him by the works that you're doing. Jesus said, not just them that cries, Lord, Lord, to me shall enter there into the kingdom of heaven, but them that doeth the will of my Father. Jesus went as far as to say, they were standing outside saying, your mom and your brethren and them are outside waiting on you. And Jesus said, who is my mother and my brethren and my sisters? But he that doeth the will of my Father. Jesus said, there are those that draw near to me with their lips, but their what? Their heart is far from me. Peter would say they profess they know me, but by their works, they deny me. So you, you can deny Christ in this world by living like the world, acting like the world, being just the opposite. You can deny it. Listen, you can go all day long telling people how you're a Christian, but if you live the opposite, you're denying him before the world. They profess they know me, but by their works, their lifestyle, Jesus said they deny me. Now think about that. They deny me. What years ago I preached on a message called a chameleon religion, you know. Chameleons, their defense is they blend in with every bit of their background. I mean, if you stick them on a green leaf, they're going to turn green. You put them on Shine's black shirt, get them long enough, they'll turn black. If you put them on a blue shirt, they'll turn blue because the chameleon changes colors to blend in with its surroundings. 
And it's easy when we come to the house of God to shout and shine and we're, and we're, and we're Christians. But why is it that when you see the same people in Walmart, they're like that crowd? For you see them out here and people that are lost and undone, they're like that crowd. They, they change their colors as a defense so they don't get mocked, rejected, made fun of, put away and all that kind of stuff. Church, Jesus ain't asking for us, amen, to, uh, to, to blend in. He wants us to stand out. He, he wants us to show the world what it means to be a child of God. And so these people have not denied him. They, they lived it in front of the other people. How many have ever seen people that would change their colors? Y'all awful quiet on me. Am I boring you tonight? Yeah. Listen to what he says. He goes on as far and says this. Behold, I'll make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. And what he's saying is that during that time, they were a mixture between the Jews and Christians. And the Jews believed that they were the chosen people of God. And in fact, they were under the old covenant. But they were coming in and they were the ones persecuting the church. They were trying to stomp out Christ. And so he said, they say they are, they are Jews, but they're not. They're at the synagogue of Satan. Turn with me to Romans real quick. I don't know why the Lord just uh, shot this in my heart real quick. Look at Romans Chapter 1, and let me share something, or chapter 2, and let me sh and show you something here. Romans chapter 2, he deals with the religious in Romans chapter 2, in verse 17. Listen to what he said here. He says, Behold, thou art called a Jew, and you rest in the law, and make your boast of God. You know his will, and approve the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and you are confident that you, are, you yourself are that thou thyself art a God of the blind, a lot of them which are in darkness, and, a, and an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and the truth of, or, and, and of the truth in the law. He says, you're a Jew, you've got the law, you make your boast of God, you say you know his will, they say you, you approve the will of God, you're confident that you're a lie and you're teaching other people, but then he says, in verse 20, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. And then he says, Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest not thou thyself. Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacraments? And then he says this, Thou that makest thy boast of the law. Well, now watch this. Through breaking the law, dishonest thou God. Then he says, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as, as it's written. And how many knows you can go along as far as a church with that? Sometimes we can say we've got the word of God. We can rest in our position as Christians. We know what the word of God says. We're confident that we're of a, a, a lot of them that are, are sitting in darkness. But if we teach others, do we, do we teach ourselves? Do we live what we try to preach to others? And this is what Paul is saying. That because you live just the opposite of what you preach to others, you dishonor God. And the name of God is blasphemed among the lost through you. You're, you're giving them an occasion to fault God through your life. And listen, friends, how many of I don't want to do that? In fact, one of the worst things David did when he, brought, when he slept with Bathsheba was he gave the enemies of God a reason to to find fault with him. They, they, they found a, a reason of, of they could fault the, the thing of God. It's a tragedy when lost people has to correct Christian people. And how many knows in Jonah, that's exactly what they did. Jonah was in that boat, the storm fell, and they went down there and said, who are you? He said, I'm a Hebrew, I'm a prophet. God told me to go to Nineveh and I headed to Joppa. And them old pagan sailors looked back at Jonah and said, well, what did you do that for? Why are you disobeying God for? And the lost was rebuking a man of God. And it's a shame that the lost knows more about how we're to live than all time than Christian. They look back and say, well, I thought you was a, a Christian. How many have heard that? What are you doing here? What are you, what are you talking like that for? You're, you're a Christian. How many have ever had that happen to you? And it's a shame when the lost world has to correct the child of God when we are to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So he says, they say that they're Jews, they're not, 
of the synagogue of Satan. These folks was persecuting that early church. And listen to what Jesus said. And I will make them to come and worship before your feet. And to know that I have loved you. You know what Jesus said? Be, there will come a day when those who have mocked and worshipped or persecuted and ridiculed you will know that I have loved you. Let me tell you something. They'll watch the church and them that's tried to stop out the church will come and worship at your feet. There's a day of retribution that will come and those who have looked down upon you, those who have mocked you, those who have ridiculed you, one day they'll come and worship at your feet. And God said, and they'll know that I've loved you. I'm going to tell you something, friends. I want the Lord's love to be placed on me. This is what he says. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience. How many knows that just simply means that they didn't, they didn't disobey him in the time of trouble. They didn't falter and fail when trouble comes. They kept the word of his patience. Know this. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. So here it is. Here's a pre-tribulation scripture right here. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell on the earth. He said, I'll keep you from the great tribulation. It's coming to all the world to try them. Jesus said, it'll be a time like has never been since the beginning of the world. Then he says, behold, I come quickly. And then he says this. Now listen to this. Hold that fast which you have, that no man take thy crown. Now listen to me. If you can't lose no rewards or crown, then why is it said possible right there for it to happen? Hold fast that which you have. That means sometimes, and I like what Brother Greg said, sometimes the miracle is just staying faithful in a day when you don't see nothing happening. Paul talks about in the book of Philippians that wherever we have appertained, appertained which means wherever you've grown spiritually, Stay spiritually. Don't retreat. Don't lose. Don't lose ground. Hold on to where you're at with your commitment and your dedication to God. I see so many people going the other way. Rather than standing fast at where they gained in their spiritual strength, gained in their commitment and dedication to God, instead of holding, holding the line, you see them backing up. But Paul said, wherever you've appertained, appertain. Hold on to that. And so what he's saying here is literally that don't let no man take your crown. Corinthians says it this way. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 3. And this is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon that foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. That's not talking about salvation, that's the work. Now fire burns up wood, hay, and stubble, but it purifies gold, silver, and precious stone. And he says that day when we stand before God, our works will be tested by the fire of God. And how many knows no flesh is ever going to glory or stand in the presence of God. And listen to what he says. If any man's work should, if, if any man's work should be burned, you'll suffer loss. But he himself should be saved yet as by fire. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, you shall receive a reward. And when Revelation 3 tells us that we are to hold on, that no man can take your crown, and there's five crowns biblically that we can receive, he said, hold on to it, that no man take your crown. That means something we've got to do. It's a fight that we've got to fight. It's a race that we have to run. And Jesus says, to him that overcometh in every church, all seven churches, Jesus says, to him that overcomes, he, then he begins to say, this is the blessing and the reward that I will give. And this is my question. If there is nothing to overcome, then why does Jesus always put this before us in every church? To him that overcomes. How many knows we got to overcome the flesh, the world, the devil, don't we? To him that overcomes, it gives us the idea 
that there's a possibility that some will not overcome. To him that overcometh, listen what it says, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God. It's a place of strength. It's a vital part. A pillar holds it up. It's a place of permanence, durability. It's a, it's a place of immortality. I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. And here's, and here's security. And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is, in, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. Nobody knows what that name is going to be but Jesus. Jesus said, I'll write upon that man his my new name. I wonder what that will be. I know when we get there, he'll give us a white stone and we'll have a new name that no man will know except he to whom it's received. And you know what? I've said it this way. I was sitting in church one time thinking about that. It just come over to me. I, I'm not saying the Spirit said it to me. But every father and mother has the privilege of naming their children. Now, Chris Davidson, or Christopher Wayne Davidson was given to me September 19th, 1974 at Patty A. Clay Hospital in Richmond. That was given to me by my birth parents. But March 13th, 1997, Alan Hensley took me to the baptistry in Pine Hill and baptized me right there. I was saved the fall prior to that. In that field, I was saved and born again, baptized at Pine Hill. And one day, I believe God the Father will take His privilege and He'll name His Son. Amen. And when you get to heaven, He'll hand you a white stone so when you're accepted. And in that stone, He'll name you. He's going to give you your own name that He Himself has named you. And there's going to be thousands times ten thousands numbers that no man could number. And you think, how could God know everybody? Listen, there's billions of stars out there. And the psalmist said that he calls everyone by name. Think about that. He calls every star by name. When Job got to asking all them questions, I think Job asked 181 questions to God. Did you know that? And God asked Job 184 questions. Where was you when I laid the foundation of the world? Tell me. When I laid the lines on the world, tell me, where was you? How, what holds the world up, Job? Can you command us? Can you tell me where the night goes and the day comes again? Can you stretch out the sand and keep the waves back, Job? He got to talking about that. And literally looks back and says, Job, when you can tell me that, you can tell me how to run your life. Because he knows what's going on. He understands where you are. The steps of a good man is ordered. And God is still sovereign in everything He does. I'm telling you, we serve a big God. And one day He'll give me a name, and one day I'll know His name that no man ever knows but us. And he said, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. You know, I'd like to be a church like that, wouldn't you? Church of love. And uh, it's the greatest restraint that we have. I tell you, friends, we, we can be all that we can in God if we'll reach out to Him, but it's entirely up to us. I wonder, friends, how many say I need to get down to business and do what, what the Lord called me to do. I talked to a fella that I used to go to church with at Pine Hill today. I called him and talked to him, asking how he's been doing. He used to pastor some things that happened. I don't know exactly what happened. I said, brother, won't you just come see us? Well, I don't know, brother, I might. I said, you know you are still got a call on your life. And I said, the giftings and the callings of God are about without repentance. And I said, brother, one day you'll stand before God. And you're going to have to answer for why you didn't do the work God's called you to do. He said, well, you don't know me. And he called his wife's name out. I said, we may sneak in and see. I said, I'd love to see you, brother. I'd love to see you. And so the main thing is let's be faithful to God. Let's get out there and do what God's called us to do. So when we stand before Him, Peter says, I just want to go to heaven. I ain't worried about them rewards. I want to go to heaven.
But I want some of them rewards too. I want everything I can get. Can you say amen? Every eye closed, every head bowed. I may say, Brother Chris, I need to be more faithful to the word that God's given me. Let me say some things. I need to be more faithful. I may mean, say, I need to hold on to where I've, where I've grown, Brother Chris. I don't want to back up. I want to hold on. Sometimes if we ain't going forward, old devil will push us back if we ain't careful. Just hold the line. Hold the line. So while they sing, let's all stand. I hope I'm not a worry. Let's gather in this. Let's gather in this pew. Or gather in this altar. Let's have a good season of prayer. God help our church. Help our people. Bless us and keep us, oh God. Move upon these. Give us all something to do, Lord God, that'll benefit you.